Thank you for joining us for Everything Under the Sun, the AccuWeather podcast. I'm your host, meteorologist Regina Miller, joined in the studio as always by my producer, Andy Robb. And Andy, I know you are completely fascinated by today's topic because we are talking about one of the greatest disasters in history, the sinking of the Titanic, and how weather actually played a role. That's right, and weather actually played a pretty significant role in its sinking, and we're going to be joined on the phone from England. Renowned Titanic expert Tim Malton, author and historian, is going to tell us all about what happened on that night. Stay with us. Well, Andy and I are joined on the phone now by author, historian, and filmmaker with three books on the Titanic, Tim Moulton. So we are so glad to have you on the phone with us. You said from sunny England today. That's right. It's usually raining in this town, but it's sunny today. It must be because of our phone call. Yeah, maybe. We have <laughs> been so fascinated, uh, everybody. I mean, this is just a mythical subject that people just have always been interested in, but... We wanted to ask you, what first got you interested in the Titanic? Well, when I was about seven years old, I watched a great film about the Titanic, uh, which some of your older listeners may have heard of, which is called A Night to Remember. Uh, it's a brilliant book by Walter Lord, and they made it into a black and white film, I think in about 1958. It's the most accurate film ever made on the Titanic. And then having watched that, that kind of got me into it. And then just finally, my, uh, my uncle, as a very young man, was taught by Lawrence Beasley, um, and he was a survivor from the Titanic. So I suppose I got into the story from first-hand accounts of people like Lawrence Beasley and Gracie and Lightola, and that's the most powerful way to understand what really happened the incredible night the Titanic sank. As a young boy, when you started researching the Titanic, uh, aside from the accounts of survivors, what were some of the other things that really drew you in about this really, really interesting mystery? Well, I think what it was, was that the weather was completely extraordinary. And everything I read about that night, about the number of stars, the calmness of the sea, and really everything about the, the pressure that night, and it started to make me see it as a disaster that was actually caused almost by, um, by a freak of nature in terms of the weather, the cold water, um, and all these aspects coming together. Obviously, the ice flow. Um, and I started to see the accident as more of a force of nature rather than any particular human cause. Let's talk about that voyage. So the voyage left on April 10th from Southampton, England? Yeah, that's correct. And so tell me about where the voyage was going, because we initially thought that, that it was heading to New York and that was going to be the first destination, but you say, really, it wasn't. Well, you're, you're kind of right. You're right, really, is that it was heading to New York. Uh, but what most people don't realize is that uh, she left Southampton on the south coast of England, just north of the Isle of Wight there, and then she headed across the channel, heading south across the channel towards Cherbourg, now, at Cherbourg in northern France, she was picking up a lot of immigrants to come for a new life in America. And what happened was she then took a lot of first-class passengers as well from Cherbourg, and then she went up around the tip of England, around Cornwall, and then she went up to a place which is very near Cork in Ireland. It's actually called Cove. In those days, it was called Queenstown. And that was her final stop before heading across the Atlantic to New York. And when she was there, she collected mail and letters and also a lot of immigrants from Ireland who were starving and who were heading for a new life in the new world in America. Now, in uh, one of the documentaries that you're a part of, uh, you were looking at the uh, an actual piece of the ship and you got to see, you know, how much work went into it. In terms of the, the scale of the ship, what went into creating such a massive vessel for its time? Well, it was just incredible. Um, you know, they said it was like a scene out of Gulliver's Travels when they made the Titanic. I mean, uh, what was amazing was there were thousands and thousands of, of dock workers. And what, what, what listeners have to understand is that everything was handmade then. Um, wow. And standing in front of what they call the big piece, which is the largest piece of Titanic, which has been recovered from the seabed, you can see that the glass is, I mean, it almost seemed as if the glass was about two inches thick, something like that. And it was built 
kind of like a tank. If, if your listeners can imagine what a tank is like, um, it's just so strong. It was the strongest ship that I've ever seen, you know, in terms of how things are built today. Now it's all welded sheet metal, whereas in those days, it was all plate steel and riveted together with steel. Probably thousands and thousands upon thousands of rivets that went into just such a massive ship. That's right. Absolutely incredible. Titanic was 882 feet long and 92 feet wide, and she weighed 70,000 tons. So she was a pretty awesome ship, and her engines were 30,000 horsepower. There's almost been a little speculation that the fact that they believed it was unsinkable. Mm -hmm. How convinced do you think that they were that the ship was indeed unsinkable? Well, um, sadly, you know, they were completely convinced um, because Titanic could be cut crosswise into three pieces, and each piece would float. So Titanic could also have a collision on a bulkhead, which is the, the word we give for a watertight wall within the vessel. And then it would flood the two uh, compartments either side of the collision, but it wouldn't sink the ship. Titanic could even float with all four of her front watertight compartments full up. Um, but what she couldn't do is float with, um, with five of them gone. And I think really the reason why they believe she was unthinkable is that they had never experienced this kind of sideswipe disaster with an iceberg before. Um, so they believed that she was safe against anything which would practically happen to her. But unfortunately, they didn't bet on the power of the ship slicing a 200-foot gash uh, underneath the vessel. Let's get into that weather the night of the yeah. the wreck because sure. um you know i've heard that witnesses described a canopy of stars and and so what i've mm. noticed in my research of the weather if i'm correct on mm. this is that there had been mm. a front that they encountered on the 12th that had little consequence there but that there had been a second front on the morning of the 14th that ushered in a, yeah. a big Arctic high. Yeah. And, and so that huge area of high pressure and really calm winds. So let's talk about what that setup looked like for them out on the ocean. Well, what it looked like um, in a nutshell was extremely beautiful. So what happened was when the sun set, it was a glorious sunset, and when it did set, uh, there was no moon that night, but the starlight was so bright that people could read their watches by it. And uh, one of the survivors said you could have played a game of football by the, uh, by the amount of light the stars were giving out. And unusually, um, you normally get this thing called atmospheric extin extinction when the stars don't quite get down to the horizon on the sea. But that night, survivors said that the stars were actually cut in half by the horizon when they met the sea. And they could actually see the stars rising on one horizon and setting on the other horizon. So it was, um, they were also, all the stars were reflected in the calm sea surface. So it was almost like looking into a 360 degrees of, of stargazing, almost like you were in space, if you like. Um, and of course, what was so incredible about this is um, that we had the freezing Labrador current, which was made up of meltwater from icebergs, and that was flowing down unusually south, uh, southerly, into the Gulf Stream. Now, the Gulf Stream is normally 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. So what you had was this very warm ocean with a, if you like, a river of cold running through it. And that's what created this um, very technical atmosphere called a thermal inversion. And that caused a lot of the problems with Titanic seeing the iceberg, but also with the potential rescue ship kind of misunderstanding the visual signals that Titanic was giving. In terms of the atmosphere conditions and in terms of how bright it was, the technology, you know, back then when somebody's working on a ship, they're relying on just two things, basically. It's the binoculars or the naked eye. How difficult was that for, for people on the ship at that time that were working uh, to be able to see around them and, and get a clear view? Well, um, it's interesting you say that. I mean, they were used to it, but of course, Titanic was going at about 30 miles an hour, okay? So what you had is effectively an icy cold wind of 30 miles an hour, even though it was a dead calm. So the lookouts were peering into this sort of icy cold air. Um, but what I would say is on the bridge, obviously they had glass in front of them, but First Officer Murdoch was so keen to see ice 
that he was actually out on the wing bridge. So he was actually out where there was no glass between him and where he was looking. And they'd also, because they expected ice, they'd also made everything dark in front of the bridge. So there was no light, what we call spilling out of any of the portholes or deck hatches. So they, they made sure that it was so dark on the ship that they could see any icebergs that were picked up. And it's important they were using the naked eye because it's actually easier to see ice, detect it with the naked eye, whereas binoculars are actually for inspecting things you've already seen. So they were using the right kit, which is their naked eyes. But unfortunately, human eyes in what we call scotopic conditions, which basically means in darkness, are not very good at picking up objects that come straight ahead. They're quite good at seeing objects going across the vision, but objects that come directly towards you, we're not so great at picking those up until they become very large. So it was almost a recipe just for like a perfect disaster, just because everything was so perfect. It, they, they saw it and it, it was just too late. That's right. I mean, I, I describe it as a perfect storm of calm, <laughs> if you like, um, because the other thing is that the lookouts noticed a very slight band of haze all the way around the horizon. And under normal circumstances, if there had been a haze or a fog, Titanic would have slowed down. But the thing is that this, the pressure was so high that it couldn't be a water haze because that would have squeezed all the, um, the sort of water out of the air. So what it was is that haze, rather like when you look at the Blue Ridge Mountains or something like that, that haze was caused by the distance of air that you were seeing through. And it's estimated that on Titanic that night, you could probably, because of the cold water, you could probably have seen for about 80 miles which is much, much further, about 10 times further than you could normally have seen. And it was that that was creating this haze. So if you like, it was haze caused by clarity. Um, and of course, the problem with that is that the iceberg looked quite a lot like haze as well. And all of the lookouts said that the iceberg suddenly appeared out of that haze. The one thing that I read, and I think I heard in some of the discussions you had on this, is that they would have used the naked eye and typically at the base of an iceberg on a normal night at sea would be sloshing against the base of it. And that would mm -hmm. indicate to them that there was an iceberg, but that calm that you talked about may have caused a problem there as well, right? That's absolutely true. So it was completely calm. So you didn't get any of that telltale white around the base you normally you can see ice at night you know even when there's no moon in time to see it but for some reason that night they didn't see it until it was too late and i believe that was to do with the combination of the calmness that you mentioned but also this mysterious haze despite the fact that the pressure was too high for a normal haze. So Titanic winds up hitting the side of the iceberg. A lot of the passengers initially, uh, if this is correct, uh, didn't actually believe that there was something going on. That's absolutely right. I mean, uh, they had all such faith in the Titanic, of course, that the, the actual order to abandon ship was the last thing they expected to, to get or be given. And in fact, it took Thomas Andrews, the designer of Titanic, it took him 47 minutes between the collision and actually telling Captain Smith that the Titanic was doomed. Um, and one of the extraordinary things is that <clears throat> the damage to Titanic was actually quite small. It was about um, sort of four square meters of damage. But the problem was it was spread out over such a long area of the hull that it couldn't be contained. And then what happened was, as the bow started to sink down, once you got open portholes and the anchor holes a chain hole and things like that going underwater, of course, it doubled and tripled and quadrupled the size of the damage. And Titanic started to sink faster and faster. And in fact, the stern of Titanic actually stayed afloat for a, a few moments longer than the bow of Titanic because they tore each other apart as, as the ship tore in half. And in fact... If Titanic had been designed slightly differently, it could have been that, that that rear part of the ship could have actually acted as a lifeboat in itself. Um, but it wasn't quite designed to do that. Um, so unfortunately, in the end, the stern piece sank as well. And that's when 1,500 people uh, went into the water. And the water was so cold that people only lived for about 20 minutes before they became unconscious. And in fact, there was a lot of phosphorescence in the water that night. It's not something one often thinks of, but um, you can imagine those poor people struggling in the water and having the beautiful green bubbles all around them, the phosphorescence. And there was also the aurora borealis that night, creating a green arch 
over the Titanic. And then you had the stars, which were blotted out by the Titanic's uh, funnels and rigging. And you could actually see the masts and things because the stars were so thick, you could see the outline of Titanic just completely like a, like a cutout. About how cold was the water on that mm. night while people were actually going overboard? It was minus two degrees. So it was actually below freezing. And the only reason why it wasn't solid ice is because of the salt content and also because of the slight swell that you get in the Atlantic. And let's not forget that the next morning when the sun came up, there was actually icebergs in an almost 360 degrees all around the Titanic. And many of the icebergs, they counted 25 icebergs that were more than 200 feet high around Titanic. And the other thing that people don't realize is that seven minutes of steaming time away from the iceberg that sank Titanic was in fact an impenetrable ice barrier 75 miles long and three miles wide through which Titanic could not have steamed. So there was an incredible amount of ice right near where Titanic sank. So they had the Californian, which was a ship not far yep. from the Titanic, who was also traveling through this environment. They described the stars and how difficult right. it was to see, uh, you know, just because of the amount of stars and probably the refraction or the reflectivity yes. of that. But I wondered why was yep. the Titanic going as fast as it was? Well, Titanic was doing about 22 knots. Now, in fact, Titanic's top speed was over 24 knots. Titanic had actually been over 24 knots when she was coming from Belfast in Ireland, where she was built, on her way to Southampton. So she wasn't going full speed. But she believed that the night was so clear that she would see ice in time to avoid it. Um, and in fact, um, in 1912, the danger of the ice region was not the danger of ice itself. It was the danger of fog, because you normally had fog associated with these types of thermal inversion. But because the pressure was so high, it was keeping the air clear. So I think Captain Smith believed that the faster they went through this ice area, while it was clear, the safer it would be. Because oh. if they slowed down and the fog came, yeah, and the fog came down, then Titanic would have to slow. And the problem is Titanic had a steerage way of six knots. So if Titanic wasn't going six knots, she couldn't steer herself at all. So I think they felt it was safer to crack on while it was clear through the area of danger. And don't forget that the Californian herself was going full speed. And then what happened was that Captain Lord of the Californian just saw the ice barrier and was able to stop in time. He saw it about a mile and a half early, okay? But then the problem with Titanic was that she didn't just see this big ice barrier and was able to come to a stop like the Californian. What happened was that she just failed to see this much smaller iceberg in front of the ice barrier. Um, so she had the misfortune to, to bump into a lump of ice that was quite difficult to see, whereas Captain Lord actually was able to see the whole ice barrier, and even he ran into the edge of the ice barrier. So not even he managed to avoid it completely, but he managed obviously not to do any damage when he came up into it. Were the crew on the Californian able to see the distress signals and lights being sent from the Titanic at the time where they were in a, a period of distress? They were, they were, and this is a rather sort of controversial area. But basically, um, they believed that the Titanic was burning oil lights, okay, because of the flickering of the lights. Now, in fact, what we now know is the flickering of the lights was caused by the distance of air they were seeing Titanic through and the layering of the air. Because in a thermal inversion, you get the heavy, dense air low down and you get the warmer air higher up. And so you get what's called a very stratified atmosphere. And that is what was causing the stars to flash on and off. And very sadly, the flashing, as well as making the constant electric light look like they were, in fact, pulsing, it, very sadly, it scrambled the Morse lamp signal between the two vessels. They were both talking to each other, but there was no way that they could understand what was being said, because if you like to put it in radio terms, the crackle was too much for them to be able to understand it. And very sadly, they decided not to wake their radio operator, and that's because they believed, because of the atmospheric conditions, they believed that Titanic, or the ship they could see, I should say, they believed it was only five miles away. Now, in fact, that means they could morph to it, and it also meant, this is a bit complicated, but it also meant that it wasn't the Titanic according to them, because they knew the Titanic should be about 10 miles away. So they believed they were looking at a 400-foot ship without radio five miles away, when in fact, 
they were looking at the biggest ship in the world with radio 10 miles away. And one of the problems was there weren't radio operators um, working around the clock, correct? Yeah, right. This is because one of the things that came out of the Titanic disaster was 24-hour radio watch. But before the Titanic disaster, you only had to have one radio operator on every ship and they would do it in they would then have to sleep you know at night um now titanic was a, a a monster ship so she had two radio operators already but after the disaster they made it that you had to have two and interestingly the actual rescue ship of titanic was called the carpathia okay not the california the carpathia and what's interesting there is that everyone imagines that the carpathia picked up titanic's radio signal for distress now actually that's kind of true but let me tell you this it was only because they rang up Titanic to say, hi there, you've got some mail waiting for you at Cape Race, okay, in Newfoundland. And it was only when they rang the Titanic that the Titanic then came back and said, where have you been? What are you talking about? We're sinking. Come at once. Was the path mm-hmm. of icebergs mapped at that time? So what they did have was they all told each other about icebergs and there were bulletins about icebergs. So they, they knew full well that there was lots of ice in 50 degrees west, right? They knew that, okay? But again, they knew it was clear. So they believed they could see it in time to turn. And then for some reason, which, which as I say, is to do with this incredible weather conditions, they just caught them out. They just couldn't see it quite. If they had a few more seconds, if they just seen it maybe 15 seconds earlier, then they'd have missed it. So it was very critically just on the limit of what what they could see and what they couldn't see. If they would have just seen it and then immediately reversed or slowed down and hit it straight on, they might have survived as well, right? Mm-hmm. They, they definitely would. Um, one of the designers of Titanic, Edward Wilding, he was not on the ship, and so he survived, obviously, to give evidence. And um, he said that if it hit head-on at 22 knots, then the first 100 feet of the ship would have kind of concertina it in like like having a smash on the on the road in your car um but what would have happened is that in fact it would have killed a number of the firemen who were sleeping in the bow of titanic but it wouldn't have killed any passengers and in fact deceleration from 20 knots to zero in 100 feet would actually not even throw people out of bed it would be quite a gentle slowing down so in fact titanic would have been destroyed at the front but would have been intact further back and she would have she would have floated but of course Murdoch didn't know that, and he was trying to miss the iceberg. And, of course, Titanic actually turned well enough that she actually did miss the iceberg. So what happens is Titanic turns left, and her stem, which is the very front of the boat, it actually does miss the iceberg. So they think that they're safe, but then there's a big shelf of ice underneath the water, and that is caused by wave erosion of the berg. And it was that shelf underwater that ripped Titanic to shreds. Wow. And so that may have led to the delay, you know, the time that it elapsed from the time that they hit the iceberg to when people were really recognizing something was going on. Yeah, they had to work it out. They had to count how quickly the water was rising. And then they realized, you see, that a lot of people think that the damage was just done under the waterline to the side of the ship. But if you speak to quartermaster Hitchens, if you like, and what the quartermaster said was, that as Titanic rumbled over the ice shelf, he could actually feel the steering wheel rattling. And basically, Titanic had a flat bottom. She didn't have a keel like a a J-class racing yacht or anything like that. She was kind of, um, you know, box-shaped. And basically, Titanic ran over the ice shelf, and it was that damage that actually ripped some of the plates off her double bottom. And then what happened was, quite late on after the collision, water started coming up through the floor of boiler room number five. And it was at that point that they knew that Titanic was doomed. Were there enough lifeboats on the Titanic? Well, this is a fascinating topic. And what I would say is that um, the Board of Trade, who controlled the number of lifeboats on ships, okay, what they wanted was they wanted to encourage ship owners to do the more expensive thing, which is make the ships very, very strong, rather than the cheap thing, which is fill unseaworthy vessels with loads of lifeboats. So what they said was, look, if your ship's got a double bottom and is, is, is made into watertight compartments and is very strong, then you only have to carry enough lifeboats to be able to ferry people from your vessel when it has an accident to the nearest waiting vessel. So the lifeboats became a ferry system and they weren't a life-saving system for the whole vessel. And that might sound crazy, but actually it's not. And I'll tell you why. 
if you want to have enough lifeboats for everyone on a ship, you have to have enough lifeboats for everyone on the ship on both sides of the ship. So you have to have twice as many lifeboats because as the ship tilts, you can't use any of the lifeboats on one side. There's that- always been this misconception of arrogance. Like, they thought it was unsinkable. They didn't have enough lifeboats because they believed it to be unsinkable. But you're saying <laughs> there was a reason they didn't have as many lifeboats at that time on that Yeah, that, that's right. And to people who say that it should have more lifeboats, more life would have been saved, what I would say is that Titanic had 20 lifeboats. And in fact, she only had time to launch 18 of them. So in fact, Titanic actually sank with two lifeboats not launched okay so you could argue if she'd had more lifeboats you know she couldn't have been able to launch any more than she actually did um the other problem was that the regulations demanded that there had to be eight sailors with every lifeboat and there were only 50 seamen on titanic who were rated as able seamen and unfortunately as each lifeboat went away the number of men capable of launching the lifeboats reduced. Because I was thinking, in one way, the weather played a good role if there would have been you yeah. know, enough lifeboats. Because it was fair weather, it would be easier to get people loaded into the lifeboats, get them out, get them away from the, the ship itself. But there was a whole number of other c- yeah. scenarios there that... Uh, that's right. In fact, some of the lifeboats were criticized for going off early. There's a very famous lifeboat that only had five people in it. Okay, But the reason for that is that although Titanic lasted for two and a half hours after the collision, her crew didn't know that. So they thought that Titanic may sink within one hour. So what they were trying to do is launch the boats, even if the boats weren't full so that people would be able to swim to the boat. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't realize how cold the water was, or at least maybe they did, but they couldn't have much choice. But only six people survived the Titanic who got wet that night. Everyone else died just from being cold. Where do you place the blame for the tragedy? I think the, the ultimate blame is, is it's the demonstration of the power of the universe. So basically, no one person is to blame, okay? Clearly... If the Titanic had hit the ice region in daylight, she wouldn't have sunk because she'd have been able to see the iceberg very easily. Um, You know, clearly, if she'd stopped as soon as she got into the the cold water, then she probably wouldn't have had a fatal collision either. Equally, if she'd gone a lot further south, she wouldn't have had a collision. But that's easy to say with hindsight. In reality, she was on her track to New York. She was doing everything that she should have been doing. She was keeping a good lookout. And what really caught them out at the end of the day was the awesome power of nature. Right. And I think it's interesting that you say it was a perfect storm of calm. So thanks so much. (laughs) My Uh, pleasure. We've appreciated our conversation with you. Great talking to you. Great. Thanks for your time. And our big thanks to Tim Malton for talking the Titanic with us. Of course, check out his book, Titanic, A Very Deceiving Night, as well as the Nat Geo documentary, Titanic, Case Closed, among others. And check out our podcast next week. We will be talking about Earth Day. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to AccuWeather's Everything Under the Sun, giving you the stories behind the weather and so much more. New episodes every Thursday. Just search for AccuWeather on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or visit accuweather.com slash podcast.